you know, back in the day, as you mentioned, they didn't yeah. have cybersecurity right. degrees, right? Right. Right. So you kind of like work your way into this industry, yeah. which is what I, I love about it so yeah. much. Yeah, I do too. I think that's a, a, a really important pe- point for people to remember. Um, a lot of us got our, like, didn't get our start in cybersecurity. We got our start in technology or, or some other biology for me. You know, it, it, it was different, but someone took a chance on us. And with the, you know, pervasiveness of, the need for cybersecurity professionals, identity professionals. I think that we need to remember to, you know, look at potential, look at transferable skill sets and really take a chance on, on uh, people because someone took a chance on us. So let's, let's pay it back for sure. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jim McDonald. I'm not here with Jeff Stedman today. Uh, He was unable to make our session today, but we've got a fantastic episode coming up. Before I get into things, I wanted to do some housekeeping items and kind of go over our discount codes for upcoming conferences. So the first one is very much in the very near future is Identity Week America. That's going to be in Washington, D.C., September 11th and 12th. We have a discount code for 30% off. It's IDAC30. Um, We'll have a link in the show notes if you want to follow that, or you can just Google Identity Week America and go through the registration process. Um, As you know, we've attended and covered the Authenticate the FIDO Alliance Authenticate Conference for the past few years. We have a discount code for that as well. It's the best one that you're going to find anywhere. It gets you 15% off your registration. It's IDAC 15. Again, we'll have a link in the show notes, uh, but it's definitely a conference that we recommend. We had Andrew Shikiar. Um, we've recorded an episode with him that will drop here in the next couple of weeks. Today, we have a fantastic guest. Is somebody that I met at the Identiverse conference this year, uh, Deneen DeFiori. She's the Chief Information Security Officer from United Airlines. Welcome to the show, Deneen. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited. Yeah, we're really excited to have you. Um, Deneen, it's kind of our tradition here to get your identity origin story. How did you get into the industry? So the question is, how did you get into identity did it choose you or did you choose it? <laughs> well, I think um, it chose me, actually. Um, I had uh, various roles in technology and um, and uh, actually kind of, uh, I'll say, fell into the identity scope and space. Uh, I was working at General Electric back in the day and uh, they were starting, we were really starting to uh, build capabilities around cybersecurity at that time is information security of IT governance, risk management, and, um, you know, being the company that GE was very separate, uh, you know, had different business units, but one of the core principles we uh, established very on was having a centralized identity system, um, which was interesting at that time at, at such a large, diverse company, but um, was able to get into it that way. Um, and uh, I guess, ironically, coincidentally, uh, moved around, you know, a couple times in my career at GE in different roles and different businesses and ended up uh, running identity for the company several times. So um, it keeps choosing me, actually. <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever get away from it. <laughs> That's a really cool story. And as we were getting ready for the show, you mentioned that your background, you got a degree in biology, which is That's a similar right. story to me. I have my degree in political science. You know, back in the day, as you mentioned, they didn't yeah. have cybersecurity right. degrees, Right, right. Right. So you kind of like work your way into this industry, yeah. which is what I, I love about it so yeah. much. Yeah, I do too. I think that's a, a, a really important pe- point for people to remember. Um, a lot of us got our, like, didn't get our start in cybersecurity. We got our start in technology or or some other biology for me. You know, it, it, it was different, but someone took a chance on us. And with the, you know, pervasiveness of 
the need for cybersecurity professionals, identity professionals, I think that we need to remember to, you know, look at potential, look at transferable skill sets and really take a chance on on uh, people because someone took a chance on us. So let's let's pay it back for sure. Pay it back. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, now, you mentioned your time at GE, General Electric. Um, it sounds like that's really where you kind of like cut your teeth in identity. And I'm wondering, do you have any interesting project stories or things that you kind of were involved with or led in terms of identity and access management? Yeah, we, we did a lot of interesting things there. And, um, you know, you look back at the time, you don't think it was that innovative or that cutting edge or or, you know, um, or that impactful, but kind of looking back on um, our pro- approach and philosophy and where we push the boundaries was some pretty cool and significant things. I mean, um, one of the things that uh, came to mind was, again, pooling all those disparate um, businesses together into one central identity system was uh, a it was it was tough, and we did it. We collapsed, you know, back in the day, collapsed. I, I can't even remember how many domains until you know, really one domain. We had uh, we really went after what I'll say true single sign on. You know, single sign on at that time, back 15 years ago, was was not really single sign on. You logged it, you know, and still to this day, a lot of organizations don't get it right. So, what we developed uh, with the tools and technologies at that time, we we developed a. Uh, great user experience so that you could get access to the applications you needed when you needed them and only be challenged, you know, for a different form of authentication when, um, when was, when it was appropriate. So we were starting single sign on, you know, risk-based authentication, zero trust authentication or zero trust type identity uh, systems before I think those terms were, were cool. Right. But um, looking back on it, it was, it was, uh, it was, it's interesting to reflect on that and see, you know, that is kind of like the the table stakes now and the standard ways of approaching things. So a lot of a lot of great projects, programs, and people that were there to to help with that. You know, that reminds me so much of of my history in identity or how I got into identity. So I was an AD administrator. So I was oh, yeah. one of those domains. I was at a company called Ingersoll Rand, which yeah. was a, a global diversified industrial company whatever that means is like we bought a bunch of brands pushed them all together and said they're one company yep and um you know ge always had the reputation of having fantastic management training so the cio of the of the sector that i worked for um you know he came from ge sure and we were kind of driving toward that same you know why do we have 15 active directory domains around the company. And, you know, there's a lot of fiefdoms, if you will. And it's not as much today, but I, I I don't think, but back in the day, that was very much a real thing. Right. I agree. And I also think identity back in the day was looked at as a, um, I'll say like an IT thing, like, you know, it's basically an IT thing, right? It was kind of, you just needed it to get the ac- access to systems. It wasn't really looking at um, looking at a strategy that not just enables, you know, just access to systems, but uh, you know, a, a better user user experience, right? And then enables privacy and trust and different things like that. So I think we've come a long way, which is really cool to see. Yeah, the conversations we were having twenty years ago was. I want to take my laptop and go right. to this other office and plug it in. And I just want to be able to <laughs> yeah. use the printer. Right? right. And I was like, you can't just <laughs> use the printer. What yep. are you thinking? So let's shift the conversation. We've been talking a lot about back in the day. Yeah. But today you're the CISO of United Airlines yes. and you gave a presentation at Identiverse. I thought it was fantastic. It, was obviously longer than some of our podcasts. So sure. can you give us kind of the cliff notes of that presentation? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've um, we've been looking at uh, specifically customer identity as an enabler of a few things as I, I just mentioned, right? Trust with our customers, um, enabling that higher level of digital interactions. Like how do we get more value between ourselves as United Airlines and our customers by increasing the trust. So looking at customer identity as an enabler for that, um, you know, we've done things which uh, might not be uh, like super 
you know, super creative or super innovative. But when you think about um, the, the, I, I can't, millions and millions and millions of accounts that we manage globally and the, the use case for airlines, pa- like the passenger use case, right? Uh, moving those identities into a modern authentication and authorization platform with, you know, with uh, the ability to uh, have a customer be secure, enable privacy, things like MFA, um, things like uh, adaptive authentication in the future, choice around um, authenticators is really something that we're striving for. So we're trying to make sure that um, we're taking all the, the the goodness of the identity technologies from a security, privacy, and trust perspective, but then also using that to enable better experiences for our customer. The more we know about our customer, the more that we understand how they like to interact digitally with our channels, the better experience and personalized journey we can offer them. So it's been um, an interesting and really cool uh, uh, journey for us to start to implement that changing from the legacy, you know, kind of authentication, get access to our website, your mileage plus member to now having this holistically holistic customer identity um, journey that provides not only the security and privacy and trust, but also that, you know, really, really personalized and, um, and uh, meaningful uh, customer experience. Yeah, that customer experience, CIAM to me, like that is where it's at in terms of yeah. exciting stuff. And I think part of that for me is, you know, the whole idea that whatever your back end is like, if it's different applications that kind of build the whole, the dot com is really like, you know, a set of infrastructure, different applications. Yeah. That should not be your customer's concern, right? Right. They right. they just want one experience. So right. there's the ability to drive a better user experience. And you talk about trust and their data not ending up maybe in third-party systems, that their authentication is strong. Right. That's one of the challenges, I think, with going to passwordless is even though we all hate the password because it's behind so many breaches, some people think if I don't have thin or password, maybe it's not as secure. So right. I think right. that's one of the things our industry will have to take on. I think the other thing with CIM is getting to that that one identity that really covers everything that yeah. becomes a backend enabler. So now That's the right. business can farm data based on the identity. So right. it's just, you're solving so many different problems by getting it right, but it's not always the easiest problem. It, to it solve is not, either. it is not the easiest problem to solve because you, like, again, those, those, the customer ecosystem, right? All those different applications and different channels, they're all disparate. They're all have been there, you know, in, different shapes and forms on different levels of maturity and capability and trying to harmonize that and make sure that you're not adding additional friction into that customer flow um, is, is a interesting challenge and it's, it's hard to overcome sometimes, but we're, we're working at it and I think we're getting it right. So hopefully if you're a, if you're a customer of ours and um, use our mobile app or our website, you'll see some um, great changes in the uh, profile account management and, um, you know, login experience as well as your, your travel journey based on identity. Right. Yeah. If you're seeing the progress, then you can, you can thank Deneen and her team. <laughs> oh, Speaking. Been a, yeah. So, yeah, speaking of kind of, a, you know, you and your team, like you're not getting it all done. You've got a, a team of smart people. So you're a leader of people within the organization. And I wanted to know what is your philosophy for building a winning team? Sure. Yeah, I've had um, several experiences across my career, you know, building really high performing, capable teams that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of. There's been folks um, that have, you know, I've hired and they're, they're, they're CISOs of companies now, which is really exciting for me to see their growth and their, um, you know, their, their, their success. So I think, you know, when, when I look at um, building teams, it's really it is a science, but it's also more of an art than a science. When you look at what you're a highly functional team, the first thing you need to do is really understand, um, okay, the outcomes that you're trying to drive. What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? And then do you have the skills, skills and capabilities um, of the people that can, you know, drive, drive to get those outcomes achieved. And sometimes, you know, having, 
you know, sometimes based on the people you would organize differently, right? Or you would bring in different complements of people, or you would, uh, you would have things arranged differently if it, if it was, you know, if it was um, different outcomes you were trying to achieve. So I really think as a leader, you have to understand your people, you know, from a skill set, a capability, um, how they work together, what motivates them, right? And put those pieces together. It's like a puzzle and make sure that they all work and they continue to function and continue to work and, and nothing's breaking down. So it is, uh, you know, it is a science. You know, there's skill sets and ways to approach that, but it also is an art. Like you have to like, you have to think about it, right? And in one situation might be the way you've organized, the way the you've um, uh, rallied around people might be great. In another situation, it might not work. So you're always kind of assessing and and looking at where you are. Yeah, it's because people are complex, right? Yeah. I mean, if you might have somebody who is really good in their domain, maybe the best in the world. Yes, but nobody can work with them. That's right. And that's right. You, I think there. I mean, speaking from my personal experience here is you know, trying to coach that person, make them to be more likable, easier to work with. Um, and hopefully you can do that. In some cases, though, it's not possible. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough part of being a leader, right? I mean, you want your your main job is you want people, you're there for them to be successful, right? You want people to succeed, you want them to be their best and contribute the, the, the you know, I mean, the most value, right? And that's your job as a leader. But you know, the other part of the a part of being a leader is, is having those tough conversations, right? And providing that feedback and, you know, receiving feedback and continuously improving. So it's, you know, it is, it, it is a responsibility of a leader to make sure you're doing that. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. The feedback piece, I think for most people I've talked to is the hardest part. Yes. Telling somebody that they're not doing a good job yeah. is never easy. Yeah. Yeah. But always balance it out. Like I always, it, it you know, when you talk about feedback, it's like, you know, in that moment, and you're like, hey, this situation could have gone better if we thought about these things, or if you did these things right. But also, you know, as a leader, don't forget to say, hey, that went awesome. And it went, it was awesome, because you did these three things, right? Keep doing those, these, those three things, you know, that because that's going to help you. Those are going to be skills that you're going to um, lean on. And, and you know, uh, that's going to be your core to, to help you in no matter, in no matter what situation you are. So I think always, always remember that, too. Yeah. So uh, some specifics here. So um, like we're big proponents of the conferences that are happening in the identity space. We always talk about the discount codes, but even with the discount codes and if you get good pricing on a conference, it's still very expensive to yeah. send people to conferences. What is your attitude on conferences for your team? Yeah, so I do. Um, I encourage uh, professional development, and that comes in a couple of different forms, right? It it also it definitely in this industry, particularly, is around conference attendance. There's all the sessions around, um, you know, the best practice sharing, and you know, meeting and networking, and understanding what other people are doing in this space because it's constantly changing, and it is a it is a I'll, I'll say a an ever evolving space, right? So I think attending conferences, keeping um, ahead and abreast of what is going on in the in the um, in the domain, as well as uh, sharing and networking is really, really important. Uh, you know, I also really encourage, um, you know, setting aside time for professional development, it may be a training course, it may be, you know, online stuff, it may be attending something in person, or it may be, you know, two weeks of or you know, a week of doing you know, research or something like that, but making sure you're dedicated to continuously learning um, is really important. Yeah, totally agree with that. And I want to kind of come back to what you're doing to to get your learn on in a little bit. Sure. Uh, before we shift topics, though, um, along with conferences, I was going to ask your attitude on certifications. Sure. So, uh, we, I use certifications in my you know, or in my organization with um, with my team as a uh, again a professional development opportunity and incentive to continue to grow and learn. Um, do I think they're absolutely necessary? No, uh, you know what I mean I think they offer a validation that you have uh, you understood the content and can demonstrate. You know what I mean whatever domain knowledge that certification is for. And I think you know as, as you're you know my you know my 
opinion is as you're starting out, maybe those certifications are a little bit more important, right? If you maybe like we talked about, you know, how do you get your start in identity or, or cybersecurity? If you're coming from a, a, a background that maybe wasn't in that domain, but then you go and you self, you, you're, you're learning, right? You're taking the self uh, motivation to learn a new skill and you're getting that sort of certification. It, even if you don't have that practical experience, I think that's, that demonstrates a lot of character, of knowledge, skills and abilities. So I think that's important. I mean, as you, as you get uh, up the ranks, maybe not, I mean, maybe not so much. Like, I don't know that people would really, I don't know that people really care if I have a, you know, CISP or if I have something else right at this point in my career, uh, you know, so I think it just depends, but I don't, I don't discourage them. I think they're valuable and people are motivated by them and they learn knowledge by obtaining them. So, you know, I think they have their place. Right. Right. I think they they're helpful for people on like the job hunt. Yeah. Um, you know, it kind of proves that you do have right. some base of knowledge. Um, and I also, what I do like about certifications is it kind of sets a target for yeah. obtaining information. But I do think that the downside of them is, is that sometimes you kind of drill into having to know some minutia that yes. doesn't really contribute yeah. to the job that you're going to be yeah. doing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one of the other areas I wanted to ask you about is like with the C CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, it's kind of a, a position that's maybe 50-50 business and technical. And so that's what I wanted to ask you about is like, how do you strike the balance between being a, a business leader and being a techie? Yeah, I, I, there definitely is a balance. And um, those, I think both domain skills are needed um, if you're in a role like mine uh, and really any, I mean, a, a, any, any um, technology role, if you can understand really what the outcomes you're, you're trying to achieve are from a business perspective, like, like what are the, what, if you are able to break down barriers or, or de-risk something, right? Then the business can do more. They can operate in a different market. They can launch a new product. They can add feature and capability that they couldn't maybe before because there were compliance issues or security issues or risks there. So really understanding the business and how it operates makes you a better technology leader, a better cybersecurity leader, a better identity leader or practitioner. So I really think you have to have to have that, I'll say, um, attitude and, and um, perspective when you're going into, into your role. Now, I lead technical teams. I value that skill set and I hold myself accountable to this day to make sure that I can at least, you know, talk the talk and demonstrate the understanding and knowledge of how things work. Um, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not like rolling up my sleeves, scripting and pounding on the keyboard and doing any of that work anymore. But I want to be able to ask the intelligent questions. I want to be able to challenge my team to think about things differently. And I need to understand the technology to do that. So I make sure that I do. Um, and then I connect the dots with the business outcomes. And then I'm also able to translate Okay, you know, I just may have I may have spent an hour or two hours with my customer identity team talking about you know the the uh, the the data flows and the you know all the different things that we need, but I can't go into our loyalty program operations leader and have that conversation. I have to have okay, you're going to get this data, and here's the impact on the customer experience. And now you'll be able to do these things because we're putting this technology in place to increase trust. Right. And I have to be able to have those conversations on both ends. Cause that way then we get aligned and we achieve better outcomes, you know, together. You might have to have those different conversations all within the same day. Right. You, yes. You've yes. got to have enough technology under your belt that your team respects you and understands yes. that you get what they do. Right. And they don't look like they feel like they have to dumb it down for you. Right. right. But at the same time, you've got to be able to go into that boardroom and that, explain right. why you need money to spend on XYZ project. Right. And you used a word earlier that I feel like is like the number one word for business leaders these days, which is outcomes. Yes. I mean, yes. That seems to be the focus that people really want to understand. 
if we do these things, what's the outcome right. we can expect? Right. Absolutely. And you have to be able to tie the work that you do um, to, again, those secure business outcomes. You have to understand like, okay, if it is customer identity, then the outcomes for uh, uh, member conversions or whatever it is, right, is that's that's what you're, that's how you're doing that. I mean, you could have the fraud metrics and the and the account takeover metrics and all those operational metrics. But in the end, what you mean, like, what, what are you contributing to the overall business goal? And I think that's really important for people to understand, like, why you're doing what you're doing. You're not existing there to do identity or cybersecurity for identity or cybersecurity sake. You're, th- you're, I'm there to help make sure that people trust United Airlines when they get on the plane, right? That's what I'm there for. I think a lot of our listeners who are the identity practitioners of the world would love to be able to have an opportunity to develop their way into a CISO or CISO-like role. And so I'm wondering kind of what is what are some of the tips that you would have for them on in terms of how to get the right experience, how to get the right education to be able to get into a position like that? And then I want to ask you, like, what do you have to do to keep your saw sharp? Sure. I always say sharpening the saw is what it's all about. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. So I think, um, actually, I think identity professionals are uniquely positioned to um, get into, you know, I'll say a CISO or a, a, a cyber leader, cybersecurity leadership position. If you think about what we do, it is, it evolves around, really the business, you mean the business processes, the HR workflow, you mean like on the enterprise side, the HR workflows on the customer side, that customer experience. So you're positioned uniquely to really have the ability to um, be immersed in understanding the business, right? And if you can develop that skill set and demonstrate your knowledge there and, and, and again, to the deliverables you have, I, I think that that's really one of the one of the key things. It, it might be harder, right, for someone that's uh, it, working in the SOC, right, as an incident response um, leader, because they're, not, they're only, not only, but they're there when something goes bad. They're not there when, hey, we're, we're you know, we're doing these great things for you and we're adding feature functionality. So I do think, you know, if you, I, I do think identity professionals are uniquely positioned um, to kind of, you know, get closer to the business than some other some other cybersecurity domains. Um, but you know, I think some of the things that I've done to get into the position at I am is again really look for, I'll say the the hard, I'll say ugly ambiguous problems and then go after it, right? Because that's how you differentiate yourself. And you have to be comfortable. Like my job every day is is like five of those situations, you know, in a row at random times <laughs> working through it, right? So you have to be built comfortable for that. And I think the earlier on in your career that you can practice be, you know, I mean, practice and kind of lean into those situations and demonstrate your capability and value to deliver a solution is really, really important. So, you know, I think I think if you can do that, you're well on your way. Um, the other thing, the last thing I'll mention on a leadership path would be influencing out, influencing without direct, I'll say, line leadership, especially in our roles as cybersecurity professionals. Like 90% of what I do and my team does, I can't, I can't do it. We can't do it. We have to have the digital technology teams do it. We have to have the the lawyers do it. We have to have the compliance people do it. We have, you know, like everybody else is executing our, you know, I mean, our policy and operationalizing it. So, um, so I do think the, the relationship uh, management and the and it being able to develop skill sets to influence people without authority is super important. I kind um, of feel like I'm with you there on that yeah. I am piece. Um, being a, a great opportunity to position yourself. I also, having been at a company like Ingersoll Rand, sounds a lot like GE. You have people that have been in their roles for 30, 40 years. Um, and sometimes it feels like, you know, there's, I could work here for the next 10 years and not get a promotion. Um, but I think it's, the, there come times where, you know, big, hard to do projects yeah. are going to come along. And yep. that's where you should try to insert yourself, even if it's a little outside of your comfort yeah, zone. It's totally. going to take some getting outside of your comfort zone to build a career. Yeah, I agree. And it, like, I think it's a little cliche to say, but if you're not 
like if you, if you don't feel like a little uncomfortable, you're probably not, you know, you're probably not learning to your, your max, you know, potential. So um, I definitely agree with you on that point. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are you doing right now to stay sharp technology sure. and business wise? Yeah. So I definitely, um, I, I definitely am a firm believer and always have been of uh, continuous learning. And that's really from a self starter perspective, right? So um, I spend hours each night kind of looking at different, um, you know, doing research, looking at different whatever blogs or, or sites or on, you know, social media followings, people that um, are, are kind of opining on issues and understanding what is going on. Read a lot of like, you know, intelligence and threat reports and making sure that we're, that I'm up to speed on that, um, as well as the new technologies that um, are coming up. So I'm, I'm definitely, you know, looking at what do I need to um, learn on a day to day basis, I have, you know, I'll, I'll spend time with my team, okay, how does this work? How this new, this new, uh, you know, if it's this uh, new uh, capability for threat detection on serverless, what does that mean? Right? Like, what does that mean? And how does it actually work? And I also have a great network that I can um, reach out to on a just in time basis, right? Uh, uh, for different subject matter experts, if I can, if I need to know something, I will reach out and, and ask them to, to help me you know, feel comfortable or get understand. And that's on the business side too. So the technology side I described, but I also have people like, okay, well, I, you know, I'm not an expert in, you know, no, uh, I'll say flight operations, right. But I need to understand that. So I don't impact, you know, the flight operations when we're doing MFA on a, on an electronic flight bag, bag um, in the middle of a, you know, in the middle of a flight. So I go and I learn, I sit with people and I observe and I make sure that I'm continuously understanding you know, what, what, how people work and, and um, what they need to do. So it, it's always about continuously le learning. Yeah. That would be really bad if someone missed their flight because of an MFA prompt or something like that, yeah. or didn't get their bag loaded. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah. And, and I, I think that someone in your position becomes expert in business, expert in technology at the appropriate levels. But then the third area is risk. Yes. I mean, yes. that's really what we've, all become right as risk professionals. You bet. You bet. That's one of the key things that I say, like any, any role that you're going to have um, in, in cybersecurity, any of the domains, you have to be an excellent risk manager, right? That's all about what we do. We identify the risks. We look at the, the treatment that we have to apply to, to manage that risk or, or understand what it means to accept that risk. So that is, that is key. And, and yeah, totally agree with that. Um, so any anything you could do to to keep uh uh you know flexing that muscle like it becomes involuntary right like that's just something in the background that you're always doing is assessing risk and you know identifying treatments and you know making sure people understand what that what their tolerance is can they accept it or not and and how that influences the path to go forward absolutely yeah definitely and that you know if if you're in this space and you want to kind of build your career I think that's one of the best ways to do is really yeah. to understand risk and be able to talk about risk and you to add risk management frameworks to the, your way of approaching problems. You, you bet. You're spot on. Totally agree. So I wanted to shift the conversation. We, we talked a lot about, um, you know, your role as CISO. Um, I think one of the other areas is managing a technology set of technology and, what I've seen is kind of a, a lot of larger organizations wind up st still having to build information security or cybersecurity mm -hmm. systems to meet their particular use cases. And it's one of the scenarios, I don't see it in small to mid sized businesses anymore where they're doing build versus buy. Yeah. But I wonder, are you still doing build versus buy analysis or do you kind of like start with, hey, we want to be on products for everything? Yeah, so we we look at it in a in a kind of a specific lens and context, right? We again always like trying to figure out oh, what risks are we mind, what risks are we trying to manage, what outcomes are we trying to achieve, and there's there's typically a platform or a solution, right, that can help us meet eighty percent of that. But we also have to take into context the uh, you mean the threat actors, the impact of um, uh, uh, the risks associated with uh, you know those threats. And then we have to kind of match up, uh, you know, 
are we okay with with not having those features or capabilities or on the platform or what do we do then? So what we typically do is we leverage um, a lot of platforms and commercial technology commercial technologies to get like the 80% done, right? And then that gap between commercial technologies and our, I'll say our, our threat profile or risk profile, we typically tend to build solutions that close that gap, you know, as, as, as best we can. And then, you know, at some point in time, what typically happens, right, is those that gap short, like the, that, what we built becomes now a, for lack of a better word, a commodity. It's in the, it's in the platform. It's in the vendor solution. And then we deprecate what we built. We use the, you know, I mean, we use the commercial, we use the commercial technology and then we go on and move to a different, you know, a different value add. So we're continuously kind of learning that way. So that's been a philosophy for, for a long time uh, for myself and um, a lot of the team members that have, um, have worked for me. And it, it, it seems to work out really well, that custom content development, um, custom solution development to bridge the gap where we don't have those standards tools. And, you know, like, again, everybody's resource, I don't care if you work for, you know, Fortune 100 company, or, you know, a small to mid sized business, everybody is resource constraints, you know, everybody doesn't have an unlimited budget, right? We're all we we don't have the, the people to do what we need to do. So we had to be very, um, very, I'll say, uh, selective and prudent around how we spend money, um, what we can actually build and maintain, you know, going forward, because there's always a cost to that as well, too. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. So, you know, one thing I was really excited about was that you were part of the keynote at Identiverse. Um, somebody who's kind of like another IM practitioner who is now overseeing uh, information security for a well-known brand, a very big company, and you're kind of one of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the exciting part. And so I wanted to get you on to the podcast, and it may have been the first time you've heard of our podcast, Identity at the Center, but when you heard that name, what did you think? No, I thought it was great. I love it. Uh, it really, really resonates with me, and I, I've said this um and you, I, I know people that worked for me um, back in the day when I started Identity can vouch for this, but I always believe identity is at the center. It is a center and, and really keystone of any cybersecurity strategy. So, you know, um, like the, 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 your name of your podcast just hit home. I think it enables a lot and informs um, any function and any capability within your cybersecurity strategy. So it is, it really is, it is the, the, the center and, and keystone. So love it. Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, we, Jeff and I just recorded episode 300 wow. during that episode. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we, we talked about this and I said, you know how the, the buzz term is identity is the new perimeter, almost such that you can say identity is the perimeter. Right. But I actually think, I actually think identity is the center yeah. and we don't really trust the perimeter anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. The perimeter, if you think of it as the firewall, keeping right. the threat actors out, yeah, it, it does that, and that's important. But eventually, there's people that are out inside of the perimeter, and we have to have safeguards, and we can't yes. trust that people inside the perimeter are all, you know, the good guys, if right. you will. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. That's awesome. Yeah. So love having you on as an identity practitioner and I wanted to kind of tap into your futurist um, point of view and understand what are some of the ideas or some of the things that are exciting to you in terms of up and coming or areas that are getting a lot of focus now in identity? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, a lot of the the focus in identity is, is really around, I'll say, um, uh, like biometrics. We're able to, you know, you talk about password lists, but biometrics in addition with the, uh, with AI and ML have made it better, right? And more trusted. And we are able to do different, different things. Um, we're able to look at identity holistically from a technology perspective because we have, um, biometrics integrated with digital identities, integrated with, uh, you know, um, I'll say, attributes and context, which I think is super exciting. There's a lot of, um, I think, really, really cool stuff going to be happening in that area in the next uh, next few um, 
you know, next few years, everything from, you know, with our, I'll say with the device manufacturers, you mean like with the device manufacturers to the, the digital entity providers to the biometrics, I think everything's going to hopefully start to merge a little bit more and we're going to get um, some, you know, um, some really cool innovative features that enable a lot of uh, uh, a lot of use cases and then ups our, our trust, right? And, and really understanding who, you know I mean, really understanding and identity uh, proofing and, and verifying um, um, people and maybe even not, uh, you know, maybe even uh, uh, non-human identities as well too. So really exciting stuff. Yeah, it's really exciting stuff. And I, and I would, I, you know, when I think about areas like that, there's, there, if the technology is there and it's affordable and it's proven, companies can start using that yes. right away. Yeah. I think there's sometimes these things feel like, oh, they're so far away. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah. boom, it's ubiquitous. You know, yes. MFA is a perfect example. Right. I was looking back in an old slide deck, it was like a 10 or 12 year old slide deck. And it was something I had put together for a client and it said, you know, next next uh down the road you're gonna be you need to implement mfa yeah, yeah. and it's like you would never make that recommendation out right. like if a client didn't have mfa right. it's like, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like run for the exits yeah 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 totally i agree yeah i agree well it's been great having you on this has been a fantastic discussion and really appreciate you taking the time it would be wrong of me not to do our traditional end on a lighter note. Sure. And so I came up with a question for you and here it goes. So you're from Cincinnati and I thought of a a couple of things that popped to my mind about Cincinnati. And I want you to tell me if they are, they should symbolize Cincinnati or if it should be something else. Okay. All right. So the first one is WKRP, the old TV show. Absolutely. I think that is, uh, that is quintessential Cincinnati and uh, you pe- people, um, all over the country and even off the, across the world. And they're like, that, what was that show? W what? And they're like less than, so yeah, it definitely is a, it, it definitely is a representation of Cincinnati. Yeah. I, I really liked that show growing up. Okay. The, the next one is great American ballpark. Uh, so I, I am a Reds fan. I like the Reds. Um, I think the ballpark is is a great place to go. And it's right in the city on the water. So I, I think it's it's uh, it's good. You know, the Reds have been, um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say the ballpark, but probably the Reds, right? I mean, they were one of the first baseball teams in America. We still have a great opening day parade. Um, uh, you know, every year it's like a, the city shuts down. Everybody takes off work. So, uh, you know, the ballpark and the Reds, I think, are are definitely – uh, representative of Cincinnati. So the last one I have, I, I think it might surprise you that I even know this one as a Cincinnati thing, which is spaghetti with chili over the top of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Skyline Chili. It's like Cincinnati Chili. There's a couple of different franchises, then, and, and there's a you're either a Skyline person or a Gold Star person, and you know they they fight about it. But um, I I've been in Cincinnati for a while now. I never like got on that trend <laughs> so, okay <laughs> so but you know when people do like people think of cincinnati they think of uh they think of uh cincinnati chili so sure sure why not we'll take it <laughs> i've done a few times with the chili at home and i yeah. just don't understand why people like it so much so <laughs> yeah you could get it shipped to your house now or or so you know all oh, over yeah. the country <laughs> i won't be doing that but um <laughs> So, Dean, is there any other Cincinnati hallmarks that you would throw into that list? So, I definitely think, um, uh, you know, I, I definitely think it's Oktoberfest. So, I don't know that people know this, but uh, Cincinnati is, uh, you know, a, a lot of German ancestry, ancestry and a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of architecture and things like that. Uh, we even have a part of the city called um, Over the Rhine, right? So, reminiscent of... Uh, of uh of the old country um but oktoberfest we have a uh, oktoberfest festival every year in cincinnati and it is the it is the second largest oktoberfest in the world versus munich so if you ever have a chance to look up oktoberfest cincinnati and be in the city you'll have a great time it's it's really fun i'm sold yeah 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 well fantastic it was great meeting you Denine, and doing this show um 
Our podcast can be found on YouTube, Identity Identity Pod, or I'm sorry, IDAC Podcast TV. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. We're on Mastodon. I think if you're a regular listener to the show, you know all those links and how to find us. It'll all be in the show notes. And um, yeah, look forward to talking to you all in the next one. For now, this is Identity at the Center podcast in Cincinnati. (laughs) (laughs) Bye, everyone. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.